I can't imagine money selling my stuff on the internet. I can't, ima- I can't make money selling my stuff on the internet. Look around. The internet is so big and vast and even comprehensible. It's truly anything can be sold online. I've seen people sell tumbleweeds and buggy whips. Greeting cards and computer generated art. Anything sold offline can be sold online. So go look at eBay. People sell cars, used clothes, dirt, used wedding dresses, even snow. I sold Elvis mermaids. I seen an Elvis mermaid on eBay. You could see a picture of a www.mrfire.com. There are really any limits of what can be sold online. I missed the right time to sell my idea. Really? Just look at the title of one of my books. There's a customer born every minute. A new crowd of prospects appears every single day. You can virtually sell anything virtually at any time if you think what people want to cater to them. Sometimes you have to think about other uses, the same product, or other audiences from what you originally had in mind. But the best time to sell is what you have is now. What are you waiting what are you waiting for? You live in America. You live in Mexico. Your selling doesn't work here. Give me a break. Friends of mine always go to Mexico and other countries said to be behind us and they come home with a truck loads of things that they bought. Besides, with the internet, what you're living is the utmost meaningless. Take your product and go online. Then you're not selling to your poor neighbors. Go to the entire planet. Think big. The list goes on and on. To me, excuses are the number one thing why people go wrong, online or offline. Write all the excuses that seem legit to a person saying to them they're virtually all hogwash. Excuses are beliefs. If you buy into them, you're stuck. If you believe instead of you're always in way around it, every excuse, every excuse, then you'll move forward. My philosophy is there is always a way. There is always a way. So let me try to help you here. First, what are your excuses? When I began this section by asking the question, I can't do what you do did because, what did you say? How did you complete the sentence? Those are some of the excuses. Second, ask yourself if there's any way on earth that around to get around your excuses. In other words, are there any excuses that stated real or imagined? Have you tried to get past any of them? Has anyone else ever gotten past them the same excuses? Finally, would you do? What would you do if you had no excuses? Whatever the answer is, that's a clue to your biggest goal. Leave your excuses behind and you will begin to attract wealth. Leave your excuses behind and you can achieve success too. Leave your excuses behind and your life will begin to soar. And if you don't act now, why not? Whatever your answer, that's an excuse. Are you going to let it stop you? Who directs your life? You see, you seem to create our lives on perceptions. If we focus on lack, we get more lack. If we focus on riches, we get more riches. If we focus on excuses, we attract more blocks. Our perceptions become magnets that pull us into the direction from which we want to go. If you don't consciously select where you want to go, then you go wherever your unconscious mind wants to go. To paraphrase a famous Swiss psychologist, Carl Jung, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and it will call it fate. In the regard of most of our us are on autopilot. We simply haven't realized that we could take control of the controls, knowing what you want and helps you aim your life in the direction from which you want to take it. But there is little more to it. For what purpose? I just watched lunch. I just had lunch with a delightful friend of mine. She had a session with Jonathan Jacobs last week and she was still glowing and her eyes were large and alive, full of passion of life. She reminded me that even though you may think that you know what you know and you know what you want, you may have to probe deeper to discover what you really want. She said she'd gone to Jonathan with the intention of creating a successful business for herself. Jonathan asked her, well, what was the purpose for? After dodging the question, the question for a while, she realized that she wanted a successful business just to prove that I am a worthwhile person. And I remembered saying, I wanted to write these books were colossal bestsellers. Jonathan asked me that same famous question is for what purpose? At, at first, I squirmed at the same things. I deserve it. I want more money. My books are good enough for it. And But the real... The real reason and underlying motivation factor was I wanted the best sellers so people would love and admire me. And when I said it, I felt shift within myself and I knew I reached the thing that I wanted. My goal, my intention was to feel love. Most people live their entire lives driven by an unconscious acknowledgement need for something else. The polit- politician may be a child who, ever got enough, who never got enough attention. The businesswoman may be a youngster who doesn't feel equal to her peers. The best-selling author may still be trying to prove he's smart or lovable or admirable. Freedom and power come from knowing what it is you want without being a prisoner to what you want. And, but... But there's another reason for knowing or stating the intention. When you declare it, you begin to discover all the things in a way of what's happening, of what you want. Pay off your house or free, be home and free, free from bills, big payments. Suddenly, all that stuff comes as your objectives and your objections. And I don't make enough money to pay off my house or no one ever does that to what will my parents think. You know what I mean. It's easy to come up with objections. The trick is to dissolve these objections until you are clear inside. And when you are clear, manifesting manifesting whatever you want will be easier. Let me explain. How you create reality. A woman went to see Jonathan because she was going to have a cancer operation on Monday. She saw him on Friday and she was terrified of the operation, wanted to get rid of her fears. Jonathan helped her and released all the fears. And two hours later, she sat up on a table and she felt healed. But she still went through the operation on Monday when her doctor opened her up and she could not, they could not find any cancer. It was gone. 
what happened? Again, our beliefs are powerful. The woman believed that she could remove the beliefs from which were causing her her fear indeed. But she didn't know that the fear was created within the cancer. When she removed the fear, the cancer left. It no longer had a home in her body. Then she had taken a conscious control of her life by choosing to see the Jonathan take care of the negative beliefs. She knew her life would be the other way. Belief on how to create a reality. From not I'm sure... I'm not sure how to explain this to you in any way that makes sense. You probably noticed that people seem to be reoccurring problems. Did you ever wonder why it was the same problem for each person? The person with money problems always has money problems. The person with relationship problems always have relationships problems. It's though each person specializes in that disorder. Beliefs, unconscious or not, are created those events until the beliefs to create the events are released. The events will continue to reoccur. I know a man who's been married seven times. He hasn't gotten it right yet. He will continue to marry and divorce until he removes the underlying beliefs that he causes the events to happen. And while he continues to marry and divorce, he will blame the other people for his problems and maybe even blame fate or God. But as you read earlier, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. What are your beliefs? Look at your life. What if you have in your direct results of your beliefs? Not happy? In debt? Poor marriage? Not successful? Bad health? There are beliefs that are creating those experiences for you. In a very real sense, some part of your wants, want of what you have, problems and all. I remember motivational guru Tony Robbins talking about a psych schizophrenic woman who had diabetes. She was one of the personalities that was healthy when another personality, she had diabetes and, and another personality, she was healthy. Beliefs can make up a personality. The woman with diabetes had believed to create the di diabetes, and it was obvious that the change of beliefs, yet you change the situation. How do you change your beliefs? It starts with selecting what you want in your life. As soon as you select what you want to be, do, or have, you'll discover the beliefs the way of the way of it, and they'll surface. They'll be, in your, they'll be your excuses. That swings back to what I was talking about earlier, that you could then reinstate your complaints so that you could become goal and intentions for you. So what do you want? What would you make your heart sing? What would make your heart sing? What would make you dance in the streets? What would make you smile right now thinking about it? What would you do if you knew you could not fail? What would you want if you can have anything? You can really have anything. So what are your limits to the, your desires? And what are your limits to your desires? I'm not sure that there are any, that you could argue a physical scientific limitation, but I think those limits based on a current research, at one point I've known that no human could run a four minute mile. Now many can do it. At what point did we knew the lead would sink into the water, that lead would, lead would sink into the water? Now we build ships out of it. At one point, everyone knew that we couldn't get to the moon, but now we've been there and done that. At this point, people assumed that disabled could not participate in sports. Now we have Special Olympics. The list goes on and on. Again, I'm not sure anything is impossible, but I'm sure that... You can't have, I'm not sure you can't have it all. Certainly the goals and intentions and wishes in an average person reading this book are within reach. You may not know how to achieve something, but you know the wish is doable somehow, some way. The only thing you need to be aware of is what Buddhists call hungry ghosts. The desires, the desires that run you rather than you run them. Desires for new shoes when you have many pairs that you don't even more might be hungry for ghosts. Desires of more property when you have plenty might be a hungry ghost. Desires for more food when you just ate might be a hungry ghost too. The hungry ghost is driven by an intense neurotic cravings, writes demonic holder in a mindfulness of money. Neurotic because the craving experience is often the displacement, displaced desire for something else. Something that they are not consciously aware of. I'm not trying to stop you from desiring anything. Desire is a good thing. It's only what motivates you to get up, to live, to work, to grow, to love. It builds you into a human system that you can use and desire to transcend your desires. But you also have to watch your mind. It can be like a wild monkey telling you to get this and, and now get that and never letting you have a sense of peace. And what you want to watch is the hungry ghost. You want to honor the desires of welling up in you, deep within you, the wishes that are from your core. When you come into this place of nothing is impossible, you can have anything that you can imagine at the point that you are aligned in the universe itself. In many ways, the universe desires will be your desires. The point is, is that you can attract anything you want, but the question remains is do you want your goals like a spoiled child in a candy store or a wild monkey drunk on power or do your desires come from essence of who you are? I know a woman who used to live in the five steps of this book and win money in Las Vegas. The rush was wonderful. The accomplishment was wonderful, but she she then missed the money and ended up in a GA, Gamblers Anonymous. She now pays attention to the hungry ghosts in her and only uses the five-step attractor formula to do good in the world. I once used the attractor formula in, to win money in Texas Lotto. I found it took a lot of energy to win a little bit of money and the accomplishment was empty. Now I focus on the joyful creating books, courses, audio recordings, bring my residual commissions while helping people, and I make a great deal of money and feel wonderful about it. I'm following my calling and I'm making a difference and I'm attracting wealth. What good do you want to do for yourself and others? Close your eyes. About 20 years ago, I attended a seminar by Stuart Wilde, author of The Trick of 
The trick to money is having some. In many other books, and I've interviewed Stuart over breakfast, found him fascinating. He's invited me to this event. One exercise in it stood out as relevant to the second step in the attractive factor formula. Stuart led up to his remarketing imagery experience, where we were able to outline and own bodies in an array of white light using a finger or a beam. Wilde suggested, trace your body with the white light. I found myself centering remarkably fast. I felt myself relaxed into the here and now. All intention slipped out of my body and let go. I felt presence like I've never before. Now, make a beam of light from the top of your head to the floor from the front of your feet. I did it, and I could see it walk like a walkway for ants. Some people, some reasons, I thought it was a joke about two mental points from which I want to escape their prison. One says, he'll turn into a flash of light, and the other can escape by walking into the ray of light. The other said, you think I'm crazy? I'll get halfway out, and then you'll turn the light off. Wild now urges us to create a mental image of ourselves and shrink it down. Now you have the image of walking down a ray of light. From the top of your head to the floor, Wilde instructed, I did what I was told, little Joe, walked down my mental beam and got to the floor, and I watched down as my mind as the midget image of me walking around my shoes and looked around the room. Just to observe what your image does, Wilde said, the little guy seemed to be a bit confused. He decided that he didn't know where to go or what to do, and he just ran to the end of my shoe and watched Stuart with me. After a few minutes, Wilde had just to bring us back and the guy back up for the light to grow full size and then merge into our bodies. What was that like for you, Wilde asked everybody. A tall man stood and said, I, I, it was confusing. My miniature image didn't know what to do. Do you know what, do you, know what you want to do, Wilde asked. Well, uh, I think so. Someone else, Wilde asked. My shrunken me... My shrunk and me had fun. She ran around and looked for the coins on the floor. Great, Wilde asked. Anyone else? I stood up. My little one just sat on my shoes and did nothing. I said, why nothing, Wilde asked. I guess he wanted to know what to do. Are you caught up in the right or the wrong, Joe? Wilde asked me. If your image didn't know what to do, maybe he was afraid to make a move unless you knew what the right move would be. Is that how your life, is that how you live your life? Well, I don't know, I said. Well, think about it, Wilde asked. Anyone else? Turns out, this little imagery technique was revealing. Whatever this little person did at the end of the beam or didn't do revealed something about the way we act on a day-to-day -day basis in our lives. We all learned something about ourselves from the unique experience. After that moment, some 20 years ago, I started to pay more attention to my own desires. You might use this imagery exercise to see your little self will do. And ask yourself if you're being honest about what you really want with your life and in your life. As you see in the next section, you'll always know what you want, but you may not always admit it. What if you still don't know? Some people tell me, I don't know what I want. I know those people. I used to be one of them. And when I asked Dr. Robert Anthony about the many best-selling books from the great audio courses Beyond Positive Thinking, what do you say to people who claim they have no idea what they want? He replied, well, I tell them that they are lying. And he's right. You know what you want. You know right now what you want. You're only the few things to save what you don't want. You are lying to yourself. Somewhere inside of you right now, right in the lowness of it all, you are willing to admit that you're own with your own desires. You simply haven't spoken on them. Dr. Robert Anthony told me everyone knows what they want. They are simply afraid to admit it. Once they admit it, they have to grow up out of that fact that they don't have it. And then they have to begin to take action to get what they want. Or they have to make excuses for not trying. But... Both way to uncomfortable. Both way to be uncomfortable to stay safe. People lie. You have the chance to achieve your desires. This book designed to give you a spiritual formula for success that never fails. The five steps of the attractive factor are already proven to work. With this information on your side, why not admit what you really want? Isn't it time? Think like God. Think like God. Many years ago, I gave a talk about how to think like God. In it, I told stories of how people were to be cured for blindness healed of autisms, achieved great wealth with the nuns seemed possible. I then urged the audience to take their blinders off and the inner mental limits and to think that they had superhuman or even super godly powers. This was a very powerful experience. People loved it. It released their restraints from which they could think bigger and bigger than ever before or ever that they thought before. God wouldn't worry about it, doubt, bicker, or delay it, stall, or think small. After all, what would you do if you had all the powers of God? No matter how you view God, you probably admit that your concepts as being his enormous power had no limits. No matter what or how you view God, you probably admit that your concept is being with enormous power and no limits. Well, if you thought like God, what would you want for yourself? What would you want for this world? Start here. Use the space below to write what you want to be, do, or have. A study by author Brian Tracy revealed the people who simply wrote down their wants and put the list away discovered that a year later that 80% of what they want had came to be. So write down your wants. 1 through 10.